Hello, my name is Sky Nemo, and today I'll be talking to you all about clinical death, whole brain death, and persistent vegetative states. By the end of this presentation, I hope that you will have a better understanding of advanced directives and consider how you may feel about medical options given different diagnoses, be able to describe clinical death, whole brain death, and persistent vegetative states, and also be able to determine the differences in the, these physiological states and how they are diagnosed. Let's begin by discussing clinical death. Clinical death is generally described as a lack of vital signs caused by an inability to maintain circulatory and respiratory function. For hundreds of years, this lack of a heartbeat and breathing was the standard for determining death in an individual. However, in 1968, a committee at Harvard Medical School determined that there should be another way of determining death due to increased medical interventions. CPR allowed patients to regain their heartbeats and mechanical ventilation allowed for breathing assistance. This is when they came up with a new determination for death called whole brain death. Whole brain death remains the standard for death determination, but it has undergone some revision. In 2010, the American Academy of Neurology rewrote the guidelines by establishing three signs that must be present for this diagnosis. First, the patient must be in a coma with a clear known cause. They must also no longer exhibit any brainstem reflexes. And finally, independent breathing without a ventilator must have permanently stopped. There are many different tests that can be done to test these brainstem reflexes, but there is a standard for neurologic reflex tests that include the pupillary response that is pictured here, where light is shown into the eye and pupillary constriction is looked for. There's also a corneal reflex where they brush a swab across the cornea and look for blinking. There's a gag reflex where they'll insert something into the throat and look for pharyngeal contraction. And then also they do a test for a response to painful stimulus where they will typically pinch you in an area where there's a high concentration of nerve bundles and see if you have a protective motor response. Since whole brain death became the determination for the standard of death, researchers have come together to identify different neurological flaws with this philosophy and have discovered in research studies that there are issues with whole brain death and brain injury that need. However, since whole brain death was determined to be the standard of death, researchers have come together to identify different neurological flaws that have been discovered in research studies concerning whole brain death and brain injury that have led them to request a new standard for determining death. There are many different areas that they're considering, but one of the main concerns is that whole brain death does not account for reversible comorbidities that can impact responsiveness and reflexes. Uh, one of notable mention would be metabolic disorders that do often cause unresponsiveness and low level stimulus interaction in patients. Next, we will discuss persistent vegetative states. This is where the outer layer of your cerebrum loses function, but your brainstem activity is maintained. So you could still have reflexes present, but be unable to conduct yourself purposefully. Some professionals pref refer to this as wakefulness without awareness. This condition is typically diagnosed after four weeks in a vegetative state and can potentially be later classified as a permanent vegetative state if improvement does not occur. There are many different events that could cause persistent vegetative states, but some of the more common ones are disruption of blood flow to the brain, severe head injuries, drug overdoses, and strokes. Some of the hallmark features that are required for a diagnosis of persistent vegetative state are no evidence of awareness of self or surroundings, no purposeful sustained response to stimuli, presence of sleep-wake cycles that are congruent with the circadian rhythm, brainstem function and some reflexes are evident, and general incontinence. So essentially what they're looking for is periods of what would appear to be sleep and wakefulness, but during the period of wakefulness, there's no response to stimuli or purposefulness. 
One ongoing study that examines persistent vegetative states is called Alive Inside and is using functional MRI and EEG scanning to determine if patients in this state are able to communicate. Patients are presented with questions and asked to imagine one scenario if the answer is yes and another if the answer is no. By using these situational scenarios that cause activation in different areas of the brain, researchers look to determine what the answer may be. Some researchers hope to use this information to help determine what the wishes of the patients in these states may be and use them as a way to determine if care should be provided or withdrawn. One controversial topic that often coincides with brain injuries and decreased quality of life is euthanasia. There are two main types of euthanasia. One is active euthanasia or mercy killing, and it is described as performing an action that ends another's life, such as administering a lethal dose of an injection. This is legal in many areas of the United States with exceptions in some states for physician-assisted suicide, in many cases, this would not apply to situations we've discussed due to patients being unable to provide consent. However, in the state of Oregon, a legal surrogate is now able to give consent on your behalf if you're unable to. Passive euthanasia is the other type of euthanasia, and it is much more common, and it involves discontinuing medical intervention that is sustaining or would continue the life of a patient in some way. So some examples of this include removing a ventilator, withholding chemo, or not doing surgery that would continue life. And this is really legally and ethically controversial, and there are many different implications that are being looked into as just something of notable mention as it pertains to brain injury. Advanced directives are legal documents that can be filed at any time. Essentially, they outline your wishes if anything were to happen to you and help you plan ahead for the future. They often include many working parts that work together to help make determinations in the future if you're unable to do so yourself. Advanced directives help to outline who can help make decisions for you, if you would like to be resuscitated, and specific medical procedures that you would like to have completed if you're unable to consent to them. And they also provide sections where you can outline any specific wishes you may have about your medical care. A medical power of attorney is often part of an advanced directive and allows you to appoint someone who you wish to make decisions for you and give consent in the event you are unable to. This can be anyone, though it is common to choose a partner or family member. It is important to make sure that they are prepared and know responsibilities as well as your wishes before they are appointed. Giving this responsibility to someone who is not ready could cause undue stress and delay treatment. Also, keep in mind that this individual may be able to make judgment calls regarding your care if you have not specifically discussed the situation that occurs. Choosing a power of attorney should be taken very seriously and could greatly impact your care or removal of care in the future.